Hello everyone, it's Eric from Strong Medicine, and today, if not already apparent from the title, I'm going to rant about the physical exam. Uh, as a professor at an academic medical center, it's my responsibility to teach uh, a broad range of skills to students, interns, and residents. Some of those skills are things like communication, or interpreting tests, or clinical reasoning. And one of those skill domains is the physical exam. And there is nothing... Um, nothing that I teach with which I have a more polarizing love-hate relationship because I love teaching some physical exam maneuvers, uh, making connections between findings and the underlying pathophysiology and talking about some of the history of the exam. But I also believe that a lot of the classic conventional exam that students are taught in the United States is at best outdated and at worst is actually unscientific nonsense rooted only in history. As in, the reason we teach such and such is because we've always taught such and such. And not only is the content outdated, but the way the content is taught is also outdated. And the consequences of this carries forward beyond training and negatively impacts our practice. So let me focus on what I think are the three biggest problems with how we in the United States currently approach and teach the physical exam. The first huge problem, we do a bad job at tailoring the exam and teaching students how to tailor the exam to the situation and to the patient. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, for example, every patient admitted to an internal medicine service in this country receives almost the same daily physical exam, irrespective of their medical history or why they were admitted. That exam looks something like this general appearance, whether the patient was awake and oriented, as if that's the only important part of cognitive assessment, vitals, the cardiac exam, but auscultation only, lung auscultation, listening for bowel sounds, observing for abdominal distension and tenderness, and observing for cyanosis, clubbing, and edema, as if clubbing that wasn't present the day before is going to suddenly appear overnight. There are some variations between institutions. For example, maybe someone will toss in a completely unnecessary comment that the pupils were equally round and reactive to light. But for the most part, this is the exam that everyone gets. To a large extent, looking for these exam findings is perfectly reasonable. When we consider what iatrogenic problems can happen in the hospital, they are things like pneumonia, deep vein thrombosis, and ileus. So listening to the lungs, checking for cath edema, and uh, feeling the abdomen you know, they all make sense. In contrast, though, I think there is a strong argument that, that things like daily routine cardiac and abdominal auscultation in every patient is unwarranted. How, however, what really doesn't make sense are all the additional maneuvers that we don't do. For example, not looking at the jugular veins in a patient with heart failure or renal failure. We can have a patient admitted for a decompensated cirrhosis on whom we fail to check asterisk six daily and I wish I had a dollar for every patient I had seen admitted for a stroke whose documented neuro exam was some version of grossly intact. The reason this happens is twofold. For one, it's because of the EMR, or electronic medical record. Almost all clinicians use pre-constructed templates when documenting inpatient encounters, uh, mostly for, for billing purposes to make sure that their documentation is consistent with what's necessary for billing. And these templates will automatically include a standard set of findings and not necessarily prompt the user for patient-specific ones. But it also happens because of the way that students are taught the physical exam. Most schools teach the, the exam separate from pathophysiology and clinical reasoning, so students don't develop an intuitive connection between a specific exam maneuver and a specific symptom or a diagnosis or a presentation. Optimally, if you had a patient with a specific history and presenting symptoms, you would instinctively know what set of exam findings to look for. But because of how we teach, this ends up being too high a cognitive load for many of us to do quickly at the bedside with the additional pressure of a sick, potentially unstable patient in front of us. So at best, we tailor the exam to the patient's so-called chief complaint, or that's the one symptom that's most prominent at the time the patient seeks medical attention. And we largely ignore issues such as the patient's age, their past medical history, and concurrent but less prominent symptoms. How should we fix this? A physical, physical exam instruction 
uh, clinical reasoning, and pathology, they should all be integrated, you know, taught alongside each other so that these connections can be better developed. The second big problem with how we approach and uh, teach the exam in the United States is uh, very short to describe. We uh, do not include enough ultrasound training. At this point, it may sound cliche to some of you, but the handheld ultrasound really is the stethoscope of the 21st century, or at least it should be. Actual evidence for using handheld ultrasound devices in making bedside diagnoses, it's generally stronger and more convincing than that for using a stethoscope, or for that matter, making diagnoses with just our eyes and our hands. And yet, it gets a tiny fraction of the attention and training. You know, I understand why this happens. You know, the devices, they are very expensive, and they are out of reach for most trainees. You know, shared devices on the wards and the clinic can be hard to track down, and they can go missing. The faculty who shoulder the bulk of formal exam instruction are often not familiar enough with ultrasound to teach this particular set of skills. But the solution to these barriers should not be to not teach ultrasound. You know, anyone who knows me well in the wards knows that I enjoy cardiac auscultation. That is, I enjoy listening and interpreting heart sounds and heart murmurs. You know, in fact, if you look back at some of my earliest videos on this channel, they are about cardiac auscultation. But in 2021, if I could choose for my students to either be competent with cardiac auscultation with a stethoscope or competent with point of care bedside cardiac ultrasound, it would be the latter, no contest. The final big problem with the exam, specifically how we teach it in the US, is that we focus on teaching the textbook exam. What do I mean by that? I consider there to be three types of physical exams. There is the textbook exam, that is the collection of physical exam maneuvers that is included in classical physical exam textbooks like Bates. It's also the set of maneuvers and findings that pathology textbooks refer to. So for example, when reading a book chapter on the pathophysiology of cirrhosis, there will be a section that lists some relevant exam findings. Exam prep resources also fall into this category. But there is also the evidence-based exam. This is the set of exam maneuvers and findings which have strong evidence for their use in the peer-reviewed literature. For example, if there was a study of 200 patients in which the presence of an S3 had a high positive likelihood ratio for reduced ejection fraction. And then there is the practical exam. This is the exam which respected, outstanding clinicians perform on patients in real life settings when not directly teaching or being observed by trainees. So a pulmonologist might percuss the lungs of a patient with COPD when a medical student is shadowing them in the exam room to demonstrate to the medical uh, student how you know, the pulmonary exam is supposed to be done. But what does that pulmonologist do when that student is not there? Do they percuss the chest in that case? Probably not. And you can see from the Venn diagram that there is a very imperfect overlap of these exams. Unfortunately, many, if not most schools, and for all I know, maybe all schools, spend the most time on the textbook exam, when what they should be spending the most time on is where the evidence-based exam and the practical exam intersect. In short, we teach our students a bunch of stuff that no one does in real life, and even if they did, it wouldn't be helpful anyway. So why? Why do we do this? Whenever I bring it up with other faculty and clinicians, I usually hear one of two reasons. The first reason, what if the student is someday practicing in a location where diagnostic testing is limited and they need to rely more heavily on the exam? That reason may sound compelling for a brief moment, but when you think about it more closely, it really it doesn't hold up. First, coming from a traditional US medical school, how often will a student eventually find themselves spending a significant amount of time practicing somewhere that doesn't have x-rays or rudimentary ultrasound? You know, I spent six months at a hospital in the highlands of Papua New Guinea where patients slept on the floor and the building sometimes literally had no running water. And even there, x-ray was available. We did not rely on agophony and tactile fremitus to diagnose pneumonia. But even more so, citing a hypothetical lack of technology is not okay because it implies that these exam findings that only fall into the textbook exam part of that Venn diagram are useful at all. But most are probably not.
you know, percussing the liver is no more helpful to diagnose cirrhosis in Rwanda or Haiti than it is in San Francisco or London. It's objectively not a useful thing to do. But going back to the other reason that people will tell me that we should be teaching the, the so-called textbook exam is because at some point our trainees will be in a position where they will be expected to do these maneuvers while their competence is being assessed. For example, uh, in an exam format known as an OSCE, or Objective Structured Clinical Examination. And if the student can't do the maneuver, you know, it's going to hurt them professionally, and it will reflect poorly on us as teachers. Unfortunately, there is some truth to the concern that a trainee will be penalized for not knowing how to do something that's actually useless. So in short, you know, we're teaching them the textbook exam not because it will help patients or make students better doctors or better uh, clinicians, but because this is the way we've always done it. And that is one of the most dangerous and short-sighted ideas in all of medicine. Meanwhile, there are, you know, there are plenty of rarely discussed and inadequately taught findings, which actually do have evidence supporting their use. But because you know, these are not a focus of the classic exam textbooks, they don't make it into the curriculum um, of, uh, of most you know, medical and PA and, and nursing schools. You know, for example, a ton of bedside ultrasound findings. Instead, what we need to do is for a collection of evidence-based medicine-minded, experienced clinicians from a variety of medical and pediatric and surgical specialties to sit down together and develop evidence-based guidelines on what physical exam maneuvers students and interns should be taught. You know, we need an official group or um, a, a institutional body, you know, maybe something like, like the double AMC to explicitly tell students, you know, um, I'm sorry, to explicitly tell schools that it's okay to teach an evidence-based exam and not one that's based on century-old historical precedent only. You know, and to be clear, at no point have I intended to argue for less physical exam training. Instead, what I'm arguing for is different physical exam training training that's based on the evidence, uses 21st century technology, and is focused on the patient's specific situation that is in front of us. You know, I struggle with this problem. As I said at the beginning, I teach a physical exam to students and I want my students to succeed in their courses and on their assessments and to be seen as competent clinicians. But I, I also don't just want them to be seen as competent clinicians. I want them to actually be competent clinicians. And I think the medical establishment in the U.S. is collectively failing them when it comes to the physical exam. Anyway, I apologize for the rant, but I think I was pretty upfront with what to expect today. Um, I'd love to hear comments from uh, medical trainees, uh, teachers of the physical exam, and the general public too. So if you have an opinion about the physical exam and physical exam training, uh, you know, please share it below.